Does anyone here own a cat? You're lying though, aren't you? Nobody ever owns a cat. I have a cat, he's called Dylan, and he regularly rubs himself up against strangers. Because you never know, I might stop feeding him. And when we go away for, I don't know, five minutes, he goes next door. And your customers are very much like that. They have choices. What happens if you um, try to tickle a cat when it's not ready? It hurts, doesn't it? Mm. So if you were to want to steal next door's cat, do you reckon you'd be better off putting it on a lead, dragging it over the hedge, or perhaps leaving out a few little treats and investing in some toys? Well, marketing's very much like that. So if you would like to uh, pinch next door's cat, I'm going to talk you through the tools and the toys that you might want to have in your basket. I'm going to ask you to take a look in and see what you're missing and invest in the right ones to choose at the right moment. There's a worksheet on your tables. And I'm going to start by asking you to have a think about the way that people buy things. So you can do this for yourself as a speaker, as a trainer, maybe the background businesses that you run. Take a moment and have a think about the people who are buying from you. Think about the amount of money that they could potentially lose if they made a poor decision. Think about the number of lives affected by the decision they're making. Think about the time it will take for them to make that decision and the time it will take them to get value from the decision they make. And then think about the number of moving parts that are impacted by that decision. Now I'm going to start on this side of the room and I would like you, over here, this is an impulse purchase, it's a see it, buy it. For me, that's Karen Millen dresses. I walk in, a dress walks out, I do pay. <laughs> So here's the Karen Millen dress, and over there is the multi-million pound piece of software. Or maybe you're the person responsible for choosing a holiday cottage for your friends. So have a think from here to over there. Put your hands up when I get to the point that your buyers are making in choosing from you. See it, buy it. Think about it a bit more. Ask around, check for creds, do some more research, think about it for a few years. Yeah. The longest I've had as a, as a buying decision is six years. They build boats. Now, the further to the right it is, the longer somebody is going to take about that decision. But what is more important is that that decision will be made through a number of pauses. So if you were to imagine these pauses, I want you to think about marketing as the stepping stones. And you will need a moment of pause for somebody to stop, think, and choose to move forwards. All the way through their decision to part with a considerable amount of money that affects a number of people on which they will probably be judged. And so if you were to think about the marketing as the moments of pause, as a salesperson, that's you, you would be one step ahead inviting them forwards. And you can do that if you have the right toys in your basket. And I'm going to take you through Three out of the 13 ways that I've seen most people waste the most money. Now, when I lay out these stepping stones, most people will say to me, oh, yes, that's a sales funnel. <laughs> Anyone heard of a sales funnel? Yeah. If you Google a sales funnel, you get, I don't know, 18 million put in pipeline or hopper, you might get a few more. Now, the thing about a sales funnel 
It's a really awful analogy. Beautiful diagram. Reducing numbers of people at each stage in the process. Awful, awful metaphor. Because everything that goes into the top of the funnel will eventually come out at the bottom. Wouldn't that be amazing? Most of us have colanders. <laughs> if you really had to choose a kitchen utensil. <laughs> now, my dad was a builder. And uh, that probably explains why I've gone for such household objects. I would like you, every time that someone says the word sales funnel, to reimagine it. And I'd like you to reimagine it as a bucket, several funnels, and loads of taps. And the really interesting thing about reimagining the sales funnel as a bucket, funnels, and taps is that it shows you that you have to start at the bottom. It stands to reason that if you have no bucket, you should not be spending money on taps. <laughs> it also, interestingly enough, if you have a bucket and simply turn the taps on full pelt, has anyone put a spoon under a tap? <laughs> nice problem to have, they say. You've just paid to ruin your own reputation. You've just paid for people to be disappointed in you. So start with a bucket, move on to several funnels, and only then switch the taps on. Which is why, in everything we do through the training program that we run, what most people spend time on is switching off taps. So I'm going to ask you three questions about your bucket. If you find it is absolutely perfect, do go on to do the rest. If it has reds and ambers in it today, spend a bit of time there. Because this works like compound interest. I think Einstein described compound interest as the eighth wonder of the world. I'm sure Rob can take you through it. Every investment that you make, if you do it in the order on your worksheets, will, inc will build incrementally on the last. If you make just a 2% difference in the conversion rate between one stepping stone and the next through each of those 13 leaks from the bottom up, you more than double your profit. If you do it top down, you waste most of the money until you get to the bottom. So upside down, bucket first. Now let's turn you to your worksheets and I'm going to ask you three questions and then I'm going to ask you to rate yourself. And I would like to get you to give yourself a zero if you have nothing that does this job. And I would like you to give yourselves a 10 out of 10 if you're world class, give me my award. Yeah, so, that's, so that's your rating scale, anywhere in between be fine. So the first leak is forgotten customers. If you forget about them, they forget about you. Does anyone here have kids? Or, or perhaps was a child once. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, we still are, absolutely. Now, I'm told that my five-year-old, when she goes back to school for year one after reception, they're going to have to teach her everything that she learned just before she went on summer holidays. She's five. She has a great little brain. Yeah, she's wired for learning. And yet, in six weeks, she forgets everything. So you will have to forgive your busy bookers for forgetting about you if you do not get in touch with them at least more often than every six weeks. Because you're not that important and they've forgotten who you were. So forgotten customers, you need to make sure that you stay in touch. You stay in touch by doing some of the great things we've heard this morning. Rob and his regular monthly video bulletin. And Nathan talked about doing email marketing. Chantelle has just talked to you about doing, laying out her newsletter themes for the whole year. I want you to think about the people you already know, people who've bought from you, people who are in the room, your colleagues here who've opted in to hear from you. You are going to need to get in touch with them more often than every six weeks to stay on radar. So have a think about them first, create content for them and get in touch. But equally, you can build this into your product. When you book a keynote, at the time, book in an impact assessment. Don't call it a feedback call. 
package in an impact assessment as an extra bonus from me as part of this package you get a six week impact assessment where I will call you and you will tell you how much impact it had and let's say they haven't quite had the impact they were expecting goodness me a top up so let's just think clearly about putting it in there so mark yourself from 0 to 10. Do you stay in touch with your current customers? The second one is onboarding. So this is between the point at which they choose you to have the impact. Choose to use. There is a moment in time in which they want to get your material. They're ready for it. And Rob talked earlier about having your press pack available, having the, uh, Emma talked about having your um, synopsis ready for the page, and beyond that, the contract, the call before the session, the impact assessment set up, the quarterly catch-up that's in place, uh, that goes in place, that is all part of your welcome window that you can plan. What do they get on day one? What do they get week one, week two? So ask yourself the question, do I have a structured communications plan from the moment that someone chooses to use me to the moment at which they get value? Naught to 10. And then the third is called no emotional connection. And this you build through a number of ways, but you break in a heartbeat. And you often break it by inconsistent visuals, by poor branding, by mishmashed materials, a poor presentation, a, a, a contract that looks messy. It just says, hmm, are you sure? And one of the key tips I would give you is to make sure that you are consistent with your own imagery. I once had a meeting with someone and I looked him up on LinkedIn and I, I walked in and it was such a disappointment because he had no hair. <laughs> I don't mind men with no hair, it's just that the LinkedIn profile was 20 years younger. Please don't use photographs that mean when you turn up, you're a disappointment. <laughs> Make sure that they can picture you in that picture and it is consistent across all of your materials and it shows up in ways on your newsletter, etc., so that they get familiar with you. So naught to 10. Is your branding powerful, consistent and friendly? Naught to 10. So if you have anything in the red or the amber zone there, there's something you can do right now to fix it. Right now. And a small tweak can make a massive, massive difference. Once you've moved something from red simply to amber to functional and not embarrassing, not perfect, we've all got money to earn. <laughs> functional and not embarrassing, then move up to the next one. And if you want to go through the next, the next 10 leaks, they're on the link for you, go and ask yourself those questions because it will pinpoint for you where to focus your precious time and energy. What that means is that when you sit down to do your marketing, you don't just come up with the next idea, you come up with the best idea. You don't just come up with the idea that someone told you last week, you focus in on the thing that's gonna make the difference to your business in the long term. And like Chantal, I want you to step off the roller coaster because roller coasters were really good, good fun when you were young and carefree. But when your mortgage and your marriage and your mental health are on the line, which they are when you run your own business and you put yourself out there, roller coasters are not fun. So when you can pinpoint where to focus your marketing and when you can do it consistently, you can step off that roller coaster and make confident decisions about your marketing so that you can go out there and make the impact that you were here to make. I'm Branny Thomas. Tweak your leaks. Thank you very much.